Well, we're back again. Um, this week, we are starting a brand new book. We are starting the book Lovecraft Country, which is probably about somebody named Lovecraft. Um, this is a great example of everything we're talking about in the class. This is a great example of the new weird. And it takes the new weird in a direction, a, a new direction, a new way of looking at the weird, and a new way of taking the themes of the weird and applying, applying them in completely different directions than what was originally intended. Now, what do I mean by that? I have no doubt that if H.P. Lovecraft was alive today and he watched the videos that me and Peter had been doing, he would take great exception to them. And he would say, oh no, everything you're saying is wrong. You don't understand anything I'm trying to do. You're misinterpreting everything I'm doing. Matt Ruff has our back. Matt Ruff is saying this, Peter asked a question at the very beginning of this class. And that question is, why is Lovecraft so important today? Matt Ruff answers that question in this book. And he says, Lovecraft is incredibly important, but not for the reason you think he is, not for the reason most people think he's important. Not, not the for the reason, reason, not the reason he would think. Not the reason that Lovecraft thinks that he's important, not the reason that the, the Lovecraft scholar thinks he's important, but because the universal messages he's talking about in different contexts. All right. So what is the weird? We've talked about this. And the weird is ultimately about that other, specifically the idea of that other world that me and Peter have talked about. The other world that is dangerous, the other world that is strange, the other world that, that lives by different rules. And what have we done? We, we have, as, as Peter has said several times, we have willful ignorance against that world. We refuse to see the truth of it. We ignore it, we push it aside, and we don't face up to it. What Matt Ruff is doing is exactly that, but he's not doing it with the weird. He's taking the theme of the weird, the idea of that other world, the idea of that world that is uh, runs by different rules, that is horrible, that gives us, fills us full of existential dread, that world that is ignored by most people. Most people do not do not see it, do not understand it. And he's saying, I'm not talking about the weird. I'm talking about America in the 1950s and the way we treat African Americans. Or, or I'll use a word that I, I I've heard you use. The scary thing is not cosmic otherness. The scary thing is the mundane, the everyday injustices of our life. That's where true terror lies. And again. I think it's really interesting. I think it's it's a really neat way to update the themes of the weird. Uh, again, and let's talk about some of the other themes of the weird. Um, one of the other themes of the old weird was the idea of a revolution, of the powerful becoming powerless, of the powerless gaining power through the avenue of the weird. Again, what this book is about. What's, this book is also knee deep in the new weird. This is one of the great books of the new weird. What's the new weird about? One of the things that Peter has mentioned is that the, the new weird is self-aware. It knows what the weird genre is. The story we're going to talk about today, Lovecraft Country, the short story that the entire book is named after, is it has Lovecraft in the name. I mean, how much more self-aware could you be? And it's full of... The characters talking about the Lovecraft circle and Lovecraft stories and what what happens in the Lovecraft story and what makes up the weird. It, it's actual text that they are discussing and thinking about. Uh, Atticus Turner, of course, grows up on the weird. He and Uncle Uncle George, okay, they grow up. They they love the weird and they're versed in it. But so is Atticus's father, Montrose. Okay, Montrose, uh, towards the end of our story, says, oh, I know how all this is supposed to end. Okay, everything gets destroyed, and if they, everything doesn't get destroyed, uh, everybody goes mad. So we, we have a self-aware story, just like what we saw with Elizabeth Baird's uh, 
um, Shogoths and Bloom and the story she Especially wrote. Especially Mongoose. Mongoose today. is very self-aware. Mongoose, very self. We have self-aware uh, stories. And uh, the, uh, the, the, interesting, the interesting thing about the weird is increasingly, okay, what we might otherwise had thought was tragic or frightening, the thing that causes dread increasingly is empowerment. And it's irresistible. We move towards empowerment because that empowerment is who we really are. The call of Cthulhu, so to speak, is a call to our true selves. And also within the new weird, we have two more things we talked about. We had about the normalization of the weird. And again, the normalization at this point has gotten to the point where, as Peter says, the existential dread is not on the weird. It's it's come full circle, and the existential dread is about the mundane. The ignorance around us, the ignorance we might have otherwise found refuge in, now becomes the thing that's dreadful. In this case, we're talking about Jim Crow uh, in the 1950s. OK, we're, we're talking about the ignorance of racism. And that now is the thing that is dreadful. And the weird, the weird is the is the secret to who we really are. In this case, who Atticus Turner really is. We have a fundamental mystery in this story, and that's the mystery of uh, of Dora, Atticus's mother. Who was she? What is her genealogy? What is her lineage? And as we, we as the story unfolds, Mont Montrose gets some answers to his question. Uh, all along, Atticus is saying, why don't you just leave that alone? OK, just leave that alone. You're supposed to leave that alone. But of course, Montrose is irresistibly drawn to learning the secret of who who Atticus really is. And what we learn is that he, Atticus is a son among sons. He is not just a descendant of the Braithwaites, but he is potentially a, a natural philosopher of extraordinary power and authority. So let's talk about the story. Um, again, so many themes. And again, we're not going to make you guys read the entire um, the entire book. We'd like you to. It's, it's very good. But for the purpose of this class, we're going to look at the first three stories to give you guys kind of a taste of what this book is about. And then we're going to skip ahead and we're going to go to the very last story in here to try to let you guys see how the story ends. And by the way, it hasn't ended, by the way. The the, the sequel to this came out last year. <laughs> and by the way, Peter, I know you haven't read it. I read uh, a review. It kind of reverses everything we've been talking about to some extent, uh -oh. unfortunately. Oh, well. But, uh, I, I, but we talked about with uh, with Mongoose in particular, uh, we talked about teamwork. Oh, yeah. that that uh, that the weird and the human can work together okay that 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 the cosmic other okay is a teammate and letitia dandridge's character okay letitia dandridge is that character uh who makes sure that she doesn't get left behind she wants to be part of the journey and the big adventure and she always turns around and said and says to atticus aren't you glad you brought me Aren't you glad you didn't leave me behind? And one of the things that lurks between the lines of the story are the Shogoths. These are the Shogoths that we associate with Lovecraft's story at the Mountains of Madness. And these are uh, monsters. These are creatures that were created by the elder things, the, the, the great old ones. That civilization that colonized Earth, that alien civilization that came to our world in pre-Cambrian times, millions and millions of years ago, and are responsible for all life on this Earth, including the Shogoths, who were their slaves, but at one point rebelled. Okay, they absorbed by osmosis a lot of the characteristics of the great old ones, of the elder things. And in these Shogoths come to the rescue of uh, of Uncle George and Atticus when they're in the woods of Devon County, when they're trying to make their way to Ardham. And the, the sheriff and his two de deputies have the drop on our heroes, but all of a sudden the Shogoths go into action and they make short work of the two deputies. But we also see Letitia. 
Letitia Dandridge. Letitia Dandridge sets uh, the sheriff's car on fire, and Letitia Dandridge apparently st uh, sneaks up behind the sheriff and clonks him on the head with a gas can. And uh, once again, you know, wow, she really comes in handy. And of course, Letitia would say, you don't realize something about me, but I'm an instrument. I'm an agent of providence. Okay, the good Lord, Jesus is making sure that I'm with you because... I'm going to make that difference. But that kind of like begs the question, uh, what exactly happened there? What is the relationship? What is the nature of this dance between the Shogoths and Letitia? We we don't really know. We know the, the Shogoths have alerted Atticus to their existence and their presence. We know that the Shogoth uh, or Shogoths, I'm not sure, singular or plural, already got the attention of Victor on a previous trip, but Victor was never harmed by the Shogoth. The Shogoths alert Letitia and Atticus, an earlier character named Victor, okay? And we wonder, well, what exactly is the, le the, is the threat level there? We know that the Shogoths are more than happy uh, to make a meal of the deputies, and we know there's something mischievous about these uh, Shogoths. There's something highly intelligent about them. And we're invited to speculate what exactly is the nature of that teamwork? What is that uh, relationship that they have? That teamwork that was much more overt and obvious, for instance, in Mongoose. And what's interesting also is the fact that um, the term Shogoth is name-checked in the story. Uh, it becomes sort of an inside joke with the characters. It becomes a synonym for just sort of bad trouble times. In fact, they what Peter has done is not actually what the characters in the story do. They don't actually recognize the creatures in the woods as Shogoths. They don't they don't actually uh, come to the realization that they're sort of the same thing. Uh, they know it's something dangerous. They know it's something supernatural, but they don't make that leap to actually calling them Shogoths. They know it's something it's something strange. And again, they know what Shogoths are. They talk about them. In the story, which I think is interesting as well. And again, it brings into more that idea of the the mundane, uh, the normalization of the weird to some extent. Um, another aspect, of well, uh, as well, is the. Oh, and I lost it. It was in my head and it floated away. Um, what was I going to say? We talked about um, the normalization of it. We talked about the self awareness. Another again is genre. Um, when I first read this story, I was not happy because I was expecting a weird story. This isn't weird. This isn't existential horror. This isn't existential dread. This isn't a horror story. And it really took me a while to realize what Matt Ruff was doing. And once I did, I was like, oh, that's actually very clever. Um, there's a lot of humor in the story. It's a lot of really dark, satirical humor in the story. There's a lot of action in the story. If I had to describe this story, I'd say it's more akin to a hard-boiled crime drama than it is um, what is traditionally called weird fiction. And again, what Matt Ruff is saying is we don't have to abide by the rules. We don't have to stay within the lines. We don't have to. We can blend. We can, we can take the lessons we learn from reading uh, Lovecraft and apply them to new situations and come away with new answers and new understanding of of the world around us. The uh, uh, in um, Shogoths in Bloom, the mundane, uh, as as Ryan might put it, the mundane horror, the everyday horror is is that of Nazism rising in Europe. Uh, I personally would have enjoyed uh, Professor Harding taking the Shogoths up on their offer. And uh, I had a vision of Professor Harding riding in on a Shogoth and laying waste uh, to uh, the Nazis in Europe. And, you know, I would have found that very satisfying. But you made a real point, I remember, in our discussion of Shogoths in Bloom. You made the real point that the new weird wants to break the cycle. The new weird doesn't merely want to reverse the, the this dynamic of master and servant. OK, the Shogoths were more than happy to be the servants of Professor Harding and to make his cause their cause. But what he really wants them to learn is freedom. He wants the Shogoths to teach themselves how not 
to be servants. And, and to me, to me, it's a little less than satisfying, but that's the decision that we watch um, Atticus Turner making in our story. Atticus Turner uh, finds the red book, the, the book that explains what is going on with this um, order, this Adamite order of ancient dawn. Okay, the cult that uh, uh, is is uh, at the heart of what the Braithwaites have been all about as a family, as as a dynastic family, so to speak, and what what uh, uh, th this this cult, okay, has a number of dimensions. But the Red Book explains it, and when he reads the Red Book, Atticus learns what his role in it is going to be. He learns that he's at the center of what this order is all about. He learns that he has a role and uh, what's going to happen is they're going to utilize him as a source of power. Now, as far as they're concerned, what Samuel Braithwaite wants to do is make him a sacrifice. But he also realizes that he is going to be empowered and he can turn the tables, okay, on the Braithwaites. Um, the uh, in the story here, uh, the uh, Adamites go by various names. They're called the Adamites. They're also called the Initiates. They're called the Dawn Seekers. They're called Sons of Adams. Uh, they're also called, and I like this term, the Antinots, as in astronauts, only Antinots. Anti means before, as in antediluvian, which means before the flood, before the fall, before what? According to Samuel Braithwaite, there was an ideal moment in which human beings were godlike. And in, in that moment, okay, and this is from the book of Genesis, when Adam names the animals, when God invites Adam to give the animals their names, according to the Red Book, according to this religion, what really was happening is that human beings were engaging in not just naming, but finishing the creation. The universe was something that God, the creator, started, but which human beings now take over and finish as creator agents in their own right. There's the painting, and in this painting, a Adamite natural philosopher is naming creatures, and they're emerging out of blob status, they're merging out of amorphous status and taking on shape. Now, that world was lost, okay? The Adamites, they are antinauts. That, that is, they are astronauts of the before the fall. They want to recreate that world. And it's that world, okay, which has something called a sun among suns. That's Caleb. But that's also that's also Atticus. And Caleb doesn't want Atticus ever to fully realize his, his power. Conveniently, Caleb gives a piece of paper to uh through William to uh Atticus. And it's the, the, the sacred language on that paper, that Adamite language, will allow Atticus to retain his human shape. But Atticus knows the other significance of that piece of paper. It not only allows him to maintain who he is in this physical sense, the sense that he's familiar with, his personhood, his humanity, it also keeps him from fully realizing his own status as somebody who has creator agency, somebody as a son among sons who has authority not just in this cult, but over the very nature of reality. Caleb wants to make sure that his rival, okay, never has full power. He always comes short. And as of this story, as of the end of this chapter, Atticus accepts that. He realizes he gave up something, but he's just as happy to be himself in that familiar sense. But he looks back at the manor. As the Woody, as the station wagon pulls away, he's that character who's not looking forward. He's in the car looking backward and he sees that manner and he realizes what he gave up.
And that's an important thing to say, because this is, again, is, as I pointed out with Shogos and Bloom, this is the new weird. This is not the old weird. If this was the old weird, it would be like a character that, that Lovecraft used, Randolph Carter, who was a reoccurring character in the story. It was the center of every short story that he was involved with. Yeah, this would be something like Robert E. Howard and his color uh, and his characters of someone like uh, Call the Conqueror or um, or or Conan the Barbarian, where he again is the center. These books are not about Atticus. Some of them are. He's in a lot of the stories. These books are about a community of people. Each story focuses on a different person. And the, the message Ruff is saying is you can't live your life like Caleb and the Dawn Society. You can't live like that. You can't have this only out for myself. Everyone else is a threat. I'm going to murder my own father because that's the only way I can have any power. What he's saying is true power comes from a community of people. It comes from not a singular idea of a master, but as in Shug Ups of Bloom, no, I'm not going to rule over you. I'm going to teach you about freedom so you can teach it to everyone else. The story is not about what Lovecraft believed in or, or what Howard believed in or what, or what really the, a lot of the Lovecraft circle believed in. Even people like C.L. Moore, the idea of the triumph of the individual, the triumph of the one lone person who has the strength and the will to overcome and make the world theirs. It's been, it's been 80 years. It's been 70 years since those stories were written. We've changed. What this is saying, it's not about the single person. It's not about the individual. It's about the community. That's where real strength lies. The re Had Atticus probably done what, what Peter wants him to do, to take that power and become, yes. he probably would have failed. Or he, even if he didn't fail this time, he'd fail somewhere else down the line. Again, this book, as Matt, saying, Matt Ruff is saying, as a society, we need to stop looking at, at, at these selfish, short-term, Individual individualist goals, and we need to start thinking about us as a people, as a community. We need to come together. And he's saying the real power of of the black person in the 1950s came from things like the Green Book. Again, we talked about the Green Book with author Macon. There is a Green Book in this story as well, and it's a real book. It was a real book published in the 1950s by. Uh, now it wasn't published by any of the people in this in this novel. It was actually published in New York, not not Chicago. But it was a travel guide. That, that is a real thing. He actually yeah. quotes from it, I believe, in places in, in these stories. And it was a real book uh, to let people know, if you go here, do not stay after sunset. You will be shot and killed. You will be lynched. If you go yeah. here, these are hotels that will like, allow you in. These are places where you can go to the bathroom. Exactly. Just simple things like that. And, 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 and he's really saying that that is where true power comes from, at least true lasting power. The empowerment power. empowerment is among people yeah we we uh, aren't you glad you brought me along says Letitia aren't you glad okay yes. the providential is in that teamwork and uh and 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 yes I I would love the satisfaction of Atticus making the decision to take on positive oblivion okay to if he had not used that slip of paper if he had not uh he would have transformed. He would have become something more. He probably would have become everything that Samuel Brathway, Caleb's father, was aspiring to but was afraid to do. In other words, there's a part of me that would love to see the reversal, the servant become the master in the fullest sense of that. Okay, there, there, there's a part of me that, want, and I think we're supposed to be tantalized. We're supposed to consider that. You know, uh, I can just see Letitia riding the sh riding the shogoths, okay? You know, um, uh, as if at a rodeo, okay? But we're tantalized by that. We uh, Atticus is going to make a different decision. And honestly, I think we should leave it there. If we if we don't, me and Peter will be here for the next five hours discussing this novel. There is, yeah. by the way, this there is so much in this, guys. Um, really, you can you can start delving in and breaking stuff apart. And it's really hitting upon all cylinders, all of the themes we've talked about up to this point. Uh, Peter's the one who suggested we use this book. I had actually not read this before we put it on the reading list. And I'm so glad he did because this book really 
contains multitudes. <laughs> Walt Whitman. All right. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, guys.